let's talk about me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Annette. As I was saying before, I lead the content team at Lattice. I call it the content team. It covers a lot of different things. Um, content marketing, community marketing, customer advocacy, web marketing, so many things. Um, but I'll say this, I was hired initially to uh, quote, build a media company within Lattice. That was literally in the job description that I replied to. Uh, and um, the interesting thing is like before I came to Lattice, I had never actually worked in B2B marketing before. Um, before Lattice, I built and ran content and community teams across media companies. Um, so you were listing um, Amrita, like a bunch of them there, Fandom, Britain Co., so on. Um, and I really wanted to go into marketing um, and really continue to build content and community in these new settings, but I needed to go to a company that I really believed in. And Lattice had a, was, you know, I, I don't think I would have ever envisioned going to B2B software as like to looking for that alignment, but the mission of Lattice was just such a wholesome and, um, and righteous one, like let's make workplaces better. And so uh, when I saw this ad, build a media company with Lattice, I knew I could really come and help um, make Lattice a better place and a better company. Um, I joined Lattice when it was around 75 people. So this is like two and a half years ago. And I was the first hire on the content team. Now we're over 500 people and my team is soon to be about 10. Um, just at, so Amrita, when you said, how do we do all those things? Uh, it's with all these great people, it's with great hires. And so I want to give a big shout out to my team because they are helping me do all the things that we're going to talk about today. Nice. And then, but it's blowing my mind that you said 75 yeah. to 500. Like, yes. Supersides kind of gone through this. I, I think I kind of joined at a similar time. We were like maybe 50, 60 people and we're just yes. over 500. And it's been like insane. I can't, it's hard to, to kind of describe to someone who hasn't been through it because like you have, Every yeah. single day you have this like cornucopia of emotions. It's like a roller coaster. Some days you're sad. Some days you're excited. The other days you're just like, holy shit, what am I doing here? Um, right. Well, just very quickly, what was it like for you? Um, yeah, the, the whole like rocket ship metaphor is actually pretty accurate. Like you sort of just like wake up one day and you've uh, doubled in size and then like a year later you've doubled in size again. It is wild. It's just the the demand for the product, like the great um, work of our product team, the great work of our sales team, our customer team. They have like helped scale this business up, and marketing has to scale with it. We have to like bring in more awareness, let people, let more people know what Lattice is, why it's great for them, and community has been a great, great, great way to do that. Um. Last thing, just as a fun point, things I'm obsessed with. Um, I hope everybody's watched HBO's Succession. I am very obsessed with it. I have we have like a whole Slack channel at Lattice that's devoted to it. Um, Boba Tea, huge a fan of Boba Milk Tea in particular. Uh, video games. I'm a mom of two, and I have a full time job, so hard to squeeze it in, but I love it. Uh, love my Instant Pot. I'm a big. Uh, I'm a big fan of food and cooking overall, but my Instant Pot is like my new fave, fave, fave thing. And uh, also finding that perfect gift or emoji, especially on Slack to like express yourself. I hope uh, everybody um, gets a little joy out of that every day. All right. Yes, Instant Pot is so convenient. It's super helpful. All right, so let's get into community. Um, the first thing I wanted to sort of clarify is that to ask what is community? Cause like everybody has, I think different perceptions of what community is. And when we talk about brand community, um, I really want to talk about three things cause it can really be any or all of these things. And um, since there is a Schitt's Creek, uh, if everybody loves Schitt's Creek um, gift for everything, um, I want to use Schitt's Creek gifts to represent what these things can be. So first of all, um, a brand community can be a professional network. Uh, here we have Moira. She's networking. Um, professional network. It could also be a customer community. It could also be or it could singularly be a customer community. And here is 
David, thanking you so much for being part of it. And then lastly, it can also be or singularly be social, social, uh, a social channel. Um, tweet us on Facebook. Always fun to tweet on Facebook. All right. So let's get into each one of these one by one, just to break it down. A professional network is a community that's open to all in a similar profession or professional function. Um, the reason why you build it is it becomes a resource and a gathering place for folks who are likely to be your ideal customer profile. Um, so if you're thinking about your funnel, these are the people that you want to get into the top of your funnel, right? Um, and so you want to attract them to, um, to, that, to that gathering spot. What it is, uh, is a space where your, hopefully your ICP can create valuable connections and get and share answers to share challenges. But more importantly, maybe what it isn't is a selling place. It is not a place where you are going to be pitching that ICP. Um, it is, you got to keep it pure. And we're going to get into that in a little bit later when we talk about um, how you build it. Um, the halo effect that it provides for your brand is a sense that you and your members are like-minded. And um, by enabling a helpful community, you earn tremendous goodwill. And we've seen this over and over and over again um, at Lattice with our, uh, with our community. Customer community is a community for your customers, right? Duh. I mean, but um, it's, it's pretty key to like understand the difference between those two things, right? Um, why you build it is bring together those who love your product and let them share stories and exchange ideas for what your product enables. So um, whether it's how they use it, um, what effect it creates for them, um, creative ways they're using it that you never thought of before, um, that's why you build it. Is uh, And then you can showcase those things. What it is, is a space to help customers feel like they're part of something bigger versus just being a buyer. Um, this makes them feel like they're part of a group of innovators. Um, and it highlights the way that they utilize your product to be innovative. So what it isn't, though, is a customer service support channel or complaint channel. Um, you have other, hopefully, really capable channels for this. Some folks do use their customer community to allow folks to get help and support. But you don't want it to turn into that. Um, because really what ends up happening is... Um, it takes over everything else that you want to get out of the community and just becomes that one function. You want to use, you know, other channels like Zendesk and so on to like really tackle those customer service issues and questions um, and complaints. You don't want it to take over your community. The halo effect it has for your brand, ability to retain highly engaged customers who can then become advocates. Um, also, you can gain ideas for the best uses for your product and even how to improve the product direct from customers. So really valuable insights um, and really valuable direct connection to your best customers. Now, social community, hopefully everybody who is in marketing on this call is already using this form of community. But if you want to think about it as a community and not just a broadcast channel, um, a community on social rallies around your brand message through social channels. And you want to create a lot of connection points within your social channels to do that. The reason why you build community on social is you can bring together those who want to stay up to date on what you're building, your thought leadership, et cetera, and like actually create conversations there. What it is, is a space to extend your brand and uh, content message. Oops, sorry about that typo and re-engage followers. So you really want to like create like this up-to-date moment and time of engagement with your, with your community. What it isn't is an aimless feed of anything and everything. It shouldn't just be a broadcast like uh, feed. It needs to really feel like um, a place where someone's at home, the lights are at home, someone isn't going to engage with you and share with you. And you can, and folks can connect with each other across a shared passion for your brand. The halo effect is obviously it helps you reach wider audiences and it helps you, helps them see your brand's value 
And uh, so if you have all three of these in some way, um, that was that was the goal for us at Lattice. And I'm going to get into how we do community at Lattice next. Um, it can really help your brand. And I'll talk to you about how each of these things feed into our community at Lattice. The first thing I want to address with how we do community at Lattice is that we actually have a separate brand for our community. So this is the Lattice brand. Um, we're a software company. We are the people success platform. We have tools, workflows, data analytics for HR leaders to build better cultures and um, influence business outcomes. Great. But Resources for Humans as a community has a separate brand. It's a it has a different name. First of all, we're not the Lattice community. It's the Resources for Humans community presented by Lattice. It is a professional network that brings together like-minded HR professionals who believe the best way to impact business is through its humans. So we want to create like this rallying point, right, for folks who have this, have similar goals, who have similar aims for their HR teams. So why create a separate brand? for your brand community. Um, uh, we're going to actually get into how we vet them. I just saw, Amrita, you have a question in, in, the, in a moment. But yes, we're going to talk about um, the importance of vetting uh, folks into the community for sure. Um, real quick, I'll cover off on like why we create the separate brand. Um, for one, for members and the mix of prospect of, and customers that are in our community, the community can feel separate from the selling experience. Um, now we do use this, we do use resources for humans as a touch point that um, sellers can use um, as in outreach to open up conversations with a value add. So membership into the community doesn't feel like something, a product that we're selling, but it does like create an open door, a new open door for a seller to reach out. Um, but we do want to create this sense that it's separate from the selling experience. And then separately, members can feel ownership and pride in the community without feeling like they're marketing lattice. And um, so it really feels like I'm part of something bigger than the software that I'm likely going to buy because I feel great alignment to what they do. So there are actually a few ways we can, uh, a member can participate in resources for humans. So we have a lot of different inroads into being part of the community, being part of something. The deepest, most, um, uh, the deepest and most active uh, engagement is Slack community. So we, uh, everyone who applies to be part of the RFH community can get a, an invitation to our Slack community. The thing is like, like, so Amrita, you're, to your point, we do vet every single person who applies. So um, just FYI, we have like a form on our, um, that where folks do, they fill out and give us their information. Um, we vet them. And if they, uh, if they meet our criteria, which is like that they are a practitioner in HR, um, we send them a Slack invitation to join the Slack community. Um, through that application, they're automatically entered into their through Marketo, um, entered into Salesforce. So it does, they do become a contact for us for our marketing team, and then uh -huh. we can also and then we can also track their journey through um, through Salesforce uh, from being a community touch point to being a business touch point later. Uh, so nice. I'll get into that in a minute when we start talking about how do you measure success. Yeah. Um, and just uh, just uh, yeah. one quick question on that. Uh, yeah. If someone were to leave and now they've gone to another company, you, do you guys keep tabs on that as well? Yes. Yeah. So usually what happens is if a member is really eager to stay in the community, um, even though they're moving companies, in some cases they may be moving roles. We've had some people move into consultancy, for example. Um, they can usually reach out to our community manager and and ask, um, hey, I want to move to this other email address. Like, can you transfer my membership and so on? It usually works out just fine. Or they can reapply um, if they forget 
you know, and um, they can reapply and get back in. But it's pretty easy. Um, but it is a ton of work on our part because we definitely know a lot of communities that don't vet their members. Um, but our community has been really adamant that they would like to keep it pure. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, they do like that safe space um, yeah. of like having common um, folks that share their challenges, not um, not likely like other uh, functions that don't get their their whole thing. Um, yeah, and especially given that it's yeah. HR, there's tons of sensitive topics, right? That exactly. they're probably discussing. Exactly, and they're very open and frank in the conversations on the channel. Um, so, so, like having a real practicing HR folks in the conversation with you is actually really important to them. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and they respect that, that safety. Um, RFH weekly newsletter is another way that you can engage. So a lot of folks that sign up that are uh, admitted into the Slack community automatically uh, are signed up for the newsletter, but there are people that if they don't want that really like um, volatile, fast and furious, like conversation that happens in the Slack community on 24 seven. Um, they can also just participate via the newsletter and get updates and get information and get all the benefits of these other things that are part of the community get into their inbox. We also mm-hmm. populate a, a part of our site um, on Lattice expressly for our FH members called our FH magazine. And it's literally just a feed of content that we think is most relevant to that professional community of HR leaders. Um, we also hold RFH events. So we publicize these on LinkedIn and other, all of our social channels. So this is another way in to the community. If you're, if we're doing a meetup, um, an RFH meetup off, uh, you know, um, employee experience professionals is an example. They, anyone who's an employee, is part of that can join in to the conversation that you don't have to be a member of RFH to join. Um, but for RFH mentorship program, um, you do have to be a member of the Slack to join that. So this is like a, what we noticed is a lot of like junior folks um, were joining the community. There are a lot of senior folks um, who they want to get access to and vice versa. Like the senior folks want to help more junior folks. So we actually started pairing them up in a mentorship program and we created a whole series of um, activations for them. And it's been a great success. We're going into our third cohort of mentorship on RFH. Um, And then also our job board, obviously HR jobs for HR folks, um, RFH database. Um, This helps us get around the Slack uh, rules. Like, so if you are thinking of doing a Slack community, are expensive you want to pay for all of your members uh the free version um it deletes a lot of the content as you go so we actually created a notion database of uh where we collect information that's uh best practices and learnings um, from the community and then lastly we use our social channels to engage members as well so um real quick i will talk about slack really fast um we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of platform to a little later. Um, everybody, everybody's community is different. Um, you want to pick the platform that really makes the most sense for enabling conversation and connection for your membership. I talked recently to another community person who was building a community for IT professionals. And they kept trying to make Slack work for them. And Slack just did not work for that community. Like people were, it was just like a dead space. Like nobody was having conversations. No one was like really like tuning in. Um, But then they built out um, later uh, more of an asynchronous uh, forum community. It was super active then. So think about like what platform makes the most sense for your community to enable conversation and connection and Slack is definitely that for us. And the HR leaders are very on board with having those conversations there. Um, Before I get into team structure, Amrita, is there anything in the questions? Yeah, there's there's a few. Um, Okay. I I guess like, let's, yeah, let's go through a couple. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about like I know Lattice is primarily B2B. Would you venture a guess as to are there like market differences between running communities for B2B versus B2C? This is a question. 
Uh, that one of the first questions today from Ray. 100%. I, I think that um, especially like when you're thinking about the different types of communities, customer communities, for example, are going to be super different uh, from B2B to B2C. Like with B2C, like um, it's going to be like, obviously when you're trying to attract cons- like consumers, like versus like business buyers, um, you want to create a lot of a different buzz, right? within your customer community. Like I think about like Lululemon and Adidas, like they've built these great customer communities for B2C um, that are all about like showing off like different ways that folks are using their products, like the communities that they're building within their own personal sphere, like around the products that they use. Um, So like for Lululemon, it's like all about yoga and like all of these like uh, specific use cases for their, for their weight, for their gear, uh, mm-hmm. for Adidas, it's more like sneakerheads and that sort of thing. And so you want to like, you're going to obviously build a different community when you're trying to appeal to that audience. Right. Mm-hmm. So for like, for our community, like we had to build a community that was like a safe space. Cause it's HR leaders. Like you said, they, they, they want like a really like protected space. They understand their role and their responsibility to their companies. And so they can't jeopardize that in any way. But, and so we had like that built that like sort of automatically created parameters for us for like what we could build and what we could enable and what was valuable to them. Um, same would go for like a B2C buyer, right? Like uh, for a consumer, you got to think about like, what is the thing that you want to enable for them? The connection that they aren't getting in the real world or one that they want to extend into the online world um, using your community. Like you need to, like, you're an enabler. You're trying to create connection. So what is the thing that's going to create that connection and where can you build it that makes it easy for um, them to see that connection happening? Mm-hmm. That in helpful. your, yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, I, I, I also kind of think of it as, I mean, granted, I haven't done this before, so take my, take my word with a grain of salt. But I, I almost feel like when you, when you set up community for consumers, they are in charge of their entire life and their entire workflow. And so the decision making process is quite different than when you, you know, you're doing this for somebody who has all of these roles that they're playing and all of these hats that they're wearing and their allegiances to themselves, like they want to grow, but their allegiance is also to the company and the people that they support in their company. So like Annette said, like they have to think about like what they're jeopardizing and what the trade-offs are. And that might actually help you sort of set the rules or the guardrails of your community differently. Um, I mean, Lululemon, com- anything probably goes. I mean, all communities are built around passion, right? And like when I built community mm-hmm. at Fandom, which is like, a very B2C community. It's like um, all people who are passionate about pop culture. Um, You have to build it around passion, right? So professional network is a passion around the profession that you're, the job that you're doing and like the passion for like wanting to grow your career. Um, Whereas like an Adidas community would be more about like the passion that you have for the, for shoes, you know, for sneakers. And, um, it may be around design, it may be about athleticism, but there are different passion points that you want to tap into because um, people will go nuts on the things that they're passionate about. And that was something I saw at fandom. Like people will create hundreds of pages of content on a wiki about, you know, Marvel. And so it's, um, it's always like about tapping into the passion. If you can't tap that passion, if you're just trying to like, for that's why the selling is so important to keep out of the equation. If they're not passionate about your product and you're trying to force like your product into the conversation around HR, like that's not great. But if they can organically get to that point, like we're building a lattice channel within the community now, but it's a space that people choose to enter into. Um, and they're really passionate about talking about lattice, then great. Like, come mm. on in. Let's like, mm. let's rally around that. Mm-hmm. Um, one attendee has asked a similar question, but I, I'll, I'll just turn it into something slightly different, which is okay. how do you, um, I guess maybe I'll ask, talk about risk a little bit. Obviously there's a lot of lattice customers inside your community. 
Yes. Does the conversation ever turn into, I don't know, complaints or some venting? Oh, you know, this didn't work or I don't like my customer success manager or whatever. You know, this yeah. customers have all sorts of complaints all the time. How do you yeah. mitigate that? So one of the things is like, if they start talking about competitors, which is always mm-hmm. like the thorny one, right? Um, we, we don't do a thing. We let them go. Like they just talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. And usually like our lattice stands show up and like advocate for lattice on just like organically. We don't prompt that at all. Mm-hmm. Um, if it turns into complaints, I mean, actually, that's actually a great segue into my next slide. That's why you have a team. You need dedicated community management, right? Mm. And our community managers tend to step in and they become like a connection point for getting that person help with our support Mm. team. Um, Mm. So uh, there are advantages to being a member of the community if you're a customer. Um, We are listening, we are paying attention and we will help our members out. Um, But uh, not to say we wouldn't help them out anyway if they're customers, but it just is another touch point that makes them feel supported. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll just keep going with the team real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our, do our, we do. Uh, so if you're building out a team, like there is a crawl walk run, right. To um, building a community. And, you know, when I started at Lattice, there was no community manager. There were people like sort of, it was part of their job, including me to help manage the community, but having dedicated community management is actually going to like help take your community to the next level because they will have like a business directive and business goals to like help drive your community forward. They will be on top of things. They'll be creating things for the community and the community will feel a connection to that person. I've seen it every day with Grace and now with Joel, who just uh, joined our team. Um, People identify and are grateful for her participation. The next layer of team, though, is not in-house. It's actually within the community. We deputize leadership within the community, um, sort of super users of the community, people who are already helping hands um, within the community, um, and create. we create an ambassador program. So each of these folks has like sort of like more ownership um, and uh, more input with how the community is run. Um, than others. And that's because of their participation and their deep commitment to making the community a great place. So now we're up to about 30 ambassadors. We're hoping to get to around 50 by the end of the year. That's and I a keep lot. going, cool. just yeah. watching the clock. Um, just to give you a sense of how RFH has grown over time, um, it was founded in around 2017, obviously zero members at that time. Uh, June, by June, 2019, my first week at Lattice, we were at 5,000 members, um, no dedicated community management, just like a wild growing vine. Um, and mainly fueled by a lot of promotion because there was a lot of internal, um, commitment to, to growing the community. Um, and so when I started, I was like, we really need to like bring some order to the chaos I have a question Um, actually, which is around um, how much do you drive the conversation in the community? That is like, I think the most, uh, I've talked to like a bunch of people because we're trying to set up our own community and everyone's like, oh my gosh, like that's the answer is like, it depends. And it's like, but how do you figure it out? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Well, so much of the community before, especially before Grace started was just like, I have a question that I desperately need help answering. Can you help me answer it? And um, someone will jump in and answer it. And that was just most of it. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. I mean, that is discussion, but it's not really like driving conversation, right? Um, Now, what we do is sort of like direct people to like spaces where conversation is already happening. So that's one way to drive conversation. So someone will jump into general channel and have a question and Grace will direct them to a conversation that's already happening somewhere else um, organically. And that drives additional conversation, which is great. 
there's also like things like Tuesday topics and these sorts of like conversation starters that Grace always feeds into the channel at least once or twice a week. There's also things like about like brags and wins that are happen on Friday. Um, all those things really help create a sense of like, I'm part of something. There's like a bigger conversation happening here than just my question that someone answered. So um, I would say it's like 60, 40 organic to driven conversation. Um, but the, when you consider that the ambassadors are helping us drive the conversation, it's like, it feels more organic than if like Grace is, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And in Grace's case, when she jumps in, she has like a mental map of where these conversations are happening or where they've already happened. Right. And wow. she also like gets alerts and things like that as an admin on the account. Um, and she tries to like use announcements at the end of the week or the beginning of the week to highlight conversations that are happening as well. So that also right. uh, enables like more participation. Got it. Um, and is the, so, is the yeah. end goal, sorry, just to pull that thread a little bit more, is the end goal uh, to get as much conversation happening? Like, is that how you guys think about it? Like more activity equals better? Yes. Because mm. the more, the more conversation that's happening, the more engaged folks are, the more likely they feel like there's value in being part of the community. Like I'm getting something out of this on a daily basis. Um, and it may not even be something that you were thinking about when you came into the community that day, but it later in, you know, by the end of the day, you've like actually participated in three other conversations and you're actually thinking about new things for your own team or your own program. Got it. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, so, you know, from June 2019 to January, we grew like an additional thousand members. But then when Grace started, like she was actually like charged with how do we grow the community faster and make it more engaged and make it feel more alive and vibrant. Um, by the end, of, by October of 2020, that year that she, her first year, we hit our 10,000 member milestone. And so in that time, um, so many people came to the community, like made it a better place. They invited their friends in. Um, it became even more known as a vibrant and um, important place. And now um, March, 2022, we're just celebrating the five-year anniversary of of RFH and we just hit 15,000 members um, with 30 ambassadors. So let's talk about business goals because this is really pretty key um, to like driving value. And um, the first one that we have year to year is to be the leading industry community for HR leaders, which is our primary buyer. So the main way we measure this is uh, obviously that the community growth number, like the number of people um, that gained um, sentiment score, uh, which we measure via survey. Um, we do two surveys a year in the community. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, and that's something that your community manager can run and keep maintaining and um, leverage those insights to build programs to make the community feel more valuable. Established Lattice is a trusted ally that creates the space, uh, maintains the quality experience and provides valuable resources for its members. Um, so even though Lattice is not the main brand on RFH, everyone has learned through their association with RFH that Lattice is the provider of RFH. And we're also the one that is keeping it this like uh, well-maintained, well-lit space. Um, so we do also measure um, lattice awareness via the survey that we conduct with our, uh, with our members. We also want to provide insights and focus areas for, uh, for what our ICP is thinking about. Um, this is, we all, always sort of jokingly refer to RFH as our focus group. Uh, it's our, of our core market. Uh, so if we're thinking about campaigns and content, we're, we always pay attention to what folks are talking about in RFH and like try to leverage that, that insight to um, make our marketing more powerful. So um, our KPIs here are, can we create content 
out of the out of discussions that are happening on RFH? Um, can we improve engagement on social and other channels through the insights that we're learning from RFH and so on? And lastly, we want to create inroads into new regions and industries. This is like a person, this is like a particular business goal for Lattice this year is how do we open up new regions like EMEA and, um, you know, uh, UKI in particular, uh, UK and Ireland. Um, how do we open up new industries beyond tech um, where, uh, where Lattice is like a thing that's known? We can really easily do some of that creeping into those new regions and into those new communities of HR leaders through our community of RFH. So we actually run campaigns within RFH and within like our promotional efforts to try and get new members in from those regions and those industries. And we also want to find ambassadors that are in those regions and in those industries so that we can like create new opportunities for those new populations. So creating membership number goals in new markets, um, ambassador recruitments in those new areas, new verticals, um, and like holding events in those new geos um, and new industries so that we can feel like they, they are part of um, the holistic RFH uh, community itself. The value, because you have to provide value if you want to keep growing the community. Um, you want to demonstrate that you're building, uh, helping them build relationships with peers in their industries. This has been particularly important during COVID. Um, when everybody's locked down, when everybody's working from home, um, they feel really isolated. HR in particular felt really isolated. So um, building relationships with the community um, helps you create value for them. Safe space, like I was saying. Um, obviously, this is different for every community. For us, it was safe space. For Adidas, for like sneaker heads, like safe space is not as quite as important, right? So this is um, this is pretty key for us as a, a value. Professional development um, for us, uh, for RFH, uh, real world L and D as we call it, and then. Um, exclusivity, feeling like you're part of a vetted and private club. So these are all like big deals. Um, Amrita, do you want me to pause here? Or do you want me to like keep going with this last slide? Yeah. Um, I think let's do a few questions. I, I, some of them probably will be answered by this slide actually, but let's, okay. let's do a few questions and come back if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm Diana, just going to pull will... this up and leave it. Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Uh, okay. We have too many questions. We usually don't have this problem. We have to like <laughs> pull. Some okay, great. Time, but we Let's have a lot of questions. It. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to call out a name. And uh, if you are interested in asking your question live, just let us know or use the hand emoji and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question live. But um, I think there's some great questions from Sam, Michael, Gibran, uh, Mina, uh, Ed Katz, and a uh, bunch of uh, anonymous people. I don't know why this is anonymous. And uh, I think Cindy, you have a great question. Uh, Melanie Hernandez, you have a great question. So if any of you wanna ask it live, please use the hand emoji and uh, Diana will unmute you. Okay, we've seen one. Ed, let's go with you. Let's ask, uh, let's ask your question. Sure, thank you. Um, Annette, I was wondering, what do you think is the most cost-effective, fastest way to build a community? <laughs> well, you, um, having a clear strategy and focus, having clear goals is really the first step because if you don't know why you're building it um, and what it's going to do for you, it's going to be really hard to like really like be laser focused on like how to grow it. Um, it then secondly, money, <laughs> you need to fund this effort in some way. Like that's, um, we do a lot of targeted promotion, um, via social channels, um, via, um, paid ads and, um, SEM, you name it. We, we, 
we have a fair chunk of our um, of our budget that's dedicated to growing the community. Um, so, and this has been from before I joined Lattice. So that's, that should tell you something. I mean, that timeline that I showed you before, um, that was like, because we, we were always, always, always promoting the community as like a value add. And when you have that laser focus and you can apply it to a promotional strategy, like that's just a great, great way to do it, to like create that, um, to create that space quickly, hopefully. Uh, so but you saw, you I was like, one, yeah. Ha, have, have you found one tactic to be more effective than the others? Um, I think that the, it's like going from zero to a hundred or zero to a thousand. It's like just promotion, right? Promote the heck mm -hmm. out of it and like have a very clear message for what the value is of that community. Um, then when you're going from like a thousand to 5,000, it's like a different game altogether. Right. Um, or like where we're at right now, where we're trying to go from 15,000 to 19,000, it's like, it's creating, um, like more, uh, it's creating deeper value and deeper connections, um, than just joining a giant group of people. Right. Um, because, it's very easy to join like a 15,000 person community and get no value out of it whatsoever. Right. Uh, but mm -hmm. you could, but if you're in a 15,000 person community and like someone is reaching out to you and actually helping you and making your life better. And you feel like you're meeting people that are helping you with your job or helping you with the, your passion project, whatever it is, um, then you're going to stay. And um, then we keep adding on to that number. Right. So um, just, you have to constantly alter your strategy from year to year. I, I think that's a hundred percent right. It's, it's sort of like that uh, age old adage, right? You can't have good, fast and cheap all at the same time. So if your constraints at this moment, Ed, are, um, you said fast and, and cheap, then I would start with a very small, almost like MVP, like something really, really tiny. And then you have to change those parameters over time. As Annette said, once you start finding like, oh, I've learned a couple of things from here. I need to change these particular things, et cetera. Right. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Let's go with uh, Gibran. Hey there. Um, Annette, thank you so much for um, this. This has been like really helpful educational. So thank you for taking the time to this. Um, awesome. You already answered this question in, in part, but um, I mm -hmm. think, um, you know, my question is, you know, when launching a community, what's a benchmark that you look at for membership to kind of get it off the ground and, and active? Um, one thing that I definitely fear is like, I don't want to make a community that's like, it's like just two people just bouncing back and forth, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's all about like those goals again, right? Um, you have to decide and like when you're deciding like what type of community am I going to build? What is the ideal member look like? Um, you, you don't want to make it so narrow that it becomes too exclusive that like it becomes only two people, for example, um, for us, like it, that's, that was the primary reason why we wanted it to be a professional network, because at the time we were a fledged, we were a pretty young startup. And um, when we built RFH and we didn't have a lot of uh, customers who to make it a customer community exclusively, but if you can, um, create like a vision for a, a mission for your community that's broad enough. Um, but then also has rules for like what um, is considered productive in the community. Um, people will respect that and also like see more value out of like that those limitations. But at the same time, you can see that it's a big enough canvas, right. For a lot of, uh, I'm mixing metaphors. I'm really sorry. Um, but it becomes a bigger space for people to join in and like feel like they're part of something that's a little bit vetted, a little bit special, a little bit safe. Um, and that's the thing is like, it's hard to build something big enough that feels exclusive because <laughs> um, people always want to feel like they're, they're part of something that's a part. And um, if you can create that value, um, it, I think that in as part of your goals for the community, then it can become big enough and 
yet feel some like like its own unit. I hope that's helpful. I'm sorry. I'm like not that wasn't a super articulate answer, but <laughs> you're thinking on the fly. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have a question that Mina has also asked here, uh, okay. which is, I think you, you mentioned these brand ambassadors, which I mean, that's the dream, right? If you can have a ton of people to spread the gospel, but how do you find them? And what is, how do you design like their commitments and perks and things like that? We have a, we, um, we, so for everything we do, whether it's for how you participate in the community and for like how you meet the bar of ambassador, um, we have rules. And I mean, I think I'm just going to like actually flip through to this slide really quick. Cause this is really like key. I'm just going to go through all these one by one. Oops. Sorry. You want to set goals. You got to select your platform, your tech stack. You do want to designate some sort of hire at some point designate or hire a community manager. Setting rules and community guidelines is so important because that is, um, that is your way to keep it a, like a, a, a well-maintained, well-lit space, right? And the same goes for how you pick your ambassadors. At lots of folks, because of the level of um, activity the ambassadors are doing within our community, lots of people now apply and want to be an ambassador which is a great problem to have, but um, it's because we set a bar, a really like, it's a high but, but reachable bar um, for becoming an ambassador. We get the best folks that we can. We set that bar high from the start. And when we started the program, we only had, we set a very reasonable goal of five ambassadors, right? For like the first six months. But we always also already knew that there were at least three people that were hitting that bar and surpassing it. So once you get five people into the program and they start like actually doing more within your community, more people want to rise to the occasion. So the, the that high bar that you set is sort of key to like not just like getting the best, but also pushing folks to want to be the best, right? So um, setting rules and community guidelines, key on both fronts, like participation in the, pro in the community and like participation in like a program like ambassadors. Um, so I've already talked a little bit about, gotta dedicate budget and resources to promote and grow the community. You wanna survey your membership for insight, both for your own like business knowledge, but also for like your knowledge about how to service the community, what they need. Um, identify and invest in your most active members, um, and then adapt and revisit performance. So um, that key of like what it takes to go from one to 500 is really different. It's just like customers going from one to 500 customers is really different than going from, you know, than going from 2000 to 4,000 customers. Mm -hmm. It's such a different process. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a, uh sort of like an opposite question. So not like what works, but Sam here is asking, um, what is something that community builders tend to spend a lot of time and effort on that you and your experience have actually found is kind of like not effective. It's almost like the what not to do list. Is there such a thing? No, because every community is different. I mean, I guess that um, don't give in on your rules and guidelines. Mm -hmm. Don't um, let up on things that are important to the community, like surveys and things like that, those sorts of things, like when you cut back or deprioritize something that is clearly super important to the community, you're going to lose people overnight. Like it's crazy. But um, I would say um, things that people spend a lot of time on. I mean, that's the thing. The adapt and revisit is so key because um, like there are lots of experiments that we run in the community all the time and they are very time consuming, right? Um, the mentorship program is a total experiment that turned out to be gangbusters hit, right? 
But for every one of those, there are like at least five or six that we put a lot of time and effort into growing and they just didn't take off. So um, I'm thinking of, uh, we tried to do AMAs like, uh, and it was just so hard to get people to show up for those things in the Slack, right? Um, They were much more willing to show up for an AMA on Zoom than they were in Slack. Um, So it was like, you just never know. I mean, maybe in another community that will work though. Um, So that's why it's worth experimenting and trying. You just never know what will stick, but you have to be willing to like give some effort to like try and um, make it work. Someone's asking me to revisit the marketing slide. So I'm going to go back to that one. Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the meantime, there's a question about level of anonymity. Uh, do you allow anonymous? No. Uh, not fully anonymous, but okay. So er, er, come as you are. We need to know who you are. Um, because like yeah. the messenger and the message are correlated. We've had people lie about their identity to get into our what? Why? Like recon? They're sellers. They're ah. sellers. Mm. Um, so we've had like sellers from uh, other from uh, competitive companies and they will DM folks within the community and say, Hey, I saw that you're interested in blah, blah, blah. And uh, we, and they are immediately booted and people will report you in a second. Oh, wow. Um, So I think it all depends on the community you're building. Like I'm sure there are some communities where anonymity is fine. Right. Um, I think anonymity is though, for the most part for a lot of communities is sort of poison because people don't trust you when you're anonymous. And if you're putting your face out there, if you're putting your, uh, who you are and what you're about out there, like they're more likely, um, to want to participate and more people will come because they feel like it's a clean, well-lit space that's well-maintained and, uh, everybody is, uh, being themselves. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to wrap up soon, but just so that uh, this slide makes sense, Megan Lawson, you asked, um, you wanted to figure out more about the roles here. If you have a yeah. specific question, raise your hand and we can let you let you ask it live. Um, otherwise, and that just- Or I uh, can just talk through it really Yeah, fast. just talk through how you thought about these specific roles. I just want to be really clear that for us, community is across all these efforts. Community plays a, at least a, a, a small to big role across everything we do in marketing. So on the content side, it, we actually develop content out of con- community conversations. It's called the RFH Insights series. And so like when we were, when vaccine policy was a big hot button issue and we didn't want to touch it as a company, as a brand, we let RFH answer that question. How are you setting vaccine policy? And we actually just rounded up their answers to that question and in that discussion um, and turned it into a piece of content. We asked them for permission to use it, of course, um, but it's a, it's a great way to like capture insights. Um, they become contributing writers to our actual, to our blog. Um, they answer topics that we are curious about. So Tuesday topics are usually things that we as a marketing team are curious about knowing more about. So like internal mobility and HR policy, comp policy, we ask that in Tuesday topics. And then survey subjects for um, like we leverage the, uh, we do like a lot of surveys and research throughout the year. And then RFH becomes part of that research pool. Um, On the product marketing side, our community members, especially the ones that are customers are some of the best uh, insight insight providers for product development. So some of them will ask them directly, Hey, would you be open to doing a, an interview with RPM? Um, they also, we listen in on the conversations about our competition. So if somebody's talking about a competitor in the channel, you bet you ask, I'm going to write that down and pass it along to, um, to folks. Also, um, we'll take, a uh, we also get beta program participants um, out of our FH, uh, people who are customers, because we know that they're passionate about the product already. Demand side, um, they become like speakers for our conferences. They drive touch points for leads. I was telling you about the Salesforce integration. Uh, they provide an additional outreach opportunity for sales. And then on the product marketing, uh, 
this is a double, sorry. Um, lots of stuff here. <laughs> I think this got doubled uh, when we were uh, creating the slides. So uh, hopefully that's not too com confusing. Product interviews, competitive Intel, alpha beta program. Hope that's helpful. A lot of touch points across everything that we do. Um, and they do become, they are more likely to become customers in the end. That's another thing that we've been able to demonstrate. Oh my gosh. That. That's the, is that the ultimate metric or what? I mean, that's, that's the entire reason to do this. To yeah. Find. I mean, that's absolutely it. Um, one of the things I think I put on this slide and I don't think I spelled it out on the slide, but it's, it was in my, it was in my original notes is that we actually showed that, um, community as a touch point is part of all of our MQL scoring. And so if you're in the B2B world, this all makes sense to you. If you're not, I'm sorry. Uh, but joining our community uh, makes uh, folks 26% more likely to become a sales lead. And so from go from MQL to SAL. So um, it, it's, it's, and comes up in conversations all the time. AEs always report back to us when uh, community members say, hey, this came up. Thank you for, you know, uh, thank you for doing what you do. It's kind of a really nice reward. That's really good. Yeah. So, but I'm guessing some of it's quite anecdotal, but you found a way to collect all of that and prove value. That's right. And like, you know, through the survey results, the campaigns that we run that result in like all these things are part of the metrics that we use to prove the success and the, and the efficacy of the community for driving business. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's end with one last question, which is, I think a few people have asked it different ways, but mm -hmm. even before you guys hit like two, three, four, or let's just say 5,000 members in your community. And I know this, like you weren't really at Lattice at, at that time, but mm -hmm. was there something like, was there something that like unlocked like the value of the community and the growth? Like, was there like a pivotal learning that you're aware of, um, you know, perhaps through hardships or perhaps uh, through like lots of trial and error, but was there like a pivotal thing where you were like, ah, this makes sense now, or like, wow, now I really know what people are passionate about. Something like that. Hmm. Uh, I don't, I will, because I wasn't here for it. I don't a hundred percent know if, um, but since I've been here, um, I will say that um, I, I'm not even sure how to answer that one, Amrita, because um, it's, uh, do you mean like, what, is there an aha moment that yeah, sort of like, uh, doesn't have to be like a crazy aha, but yeah, like a sort of like an aha moment, like, you know, when you realize and you've tried something new for the first time, like with anything, yeah. right? Like any, any marketing thing. And you're just like, oh, this is what people want. Oh, this is what's going to work. Like, was there something like that? Um, I would say that a few things like we did when we, when Grace joined and like we were running the survey. Like, honestly, running the survey taught us so much about like what people truly valued about being part of the community. And, you know, it was, we, that's how we learned like safe space was so important. That's how we learned that, um, um, you know, that uh, creating like opportunities to connect junior and senior people was important. That's how we learned that events, um, especially during COVID, were important because virtual events helped people like feel less isolated. We also learned that like getting help from people who are in your same challenge um, is important. Like, so I would say the sooner you can survey, like once you get a critical mass of people, the better. You learn so much. And like we were able to like take resources from like like we should ask less about this and more about this. We should like put less into this and more into this based off of the surveys that we ran. And it like really helped us like actually also go to bat for like budget for like things that we thought would really move the needle as well. So, um, and when we like started like thinking about ways that we could integrate community into more aspects of marketing, 
Um, we knew from the surveys, like they want more of this, less of this, if we integrate it this way. So like um, creating opportunities to like see the HR point of view. Like, so we decided to create a speaking track within our conference that was specifically an RFH speaker who was talking about that topic. Um, we knew that that was going to be a hit. So it takes a little bit of the risk out of like the experimentation. Yeah, makes sense. Awesome. This was super valuable. I mean, my notebook is full of like little tips and notes and stuff. And I have like a million other questions to ask you, but thank you to you. Thank you to all the attendees yep. for asking all the great questions and for all your engagement. And uh, Annette, how can people reach you if they have like more stuff to run by you? Please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to um, provide more help if I can. And I think you all are going to send out this um, presentation afterwards. Hopefully that can be helpful as well. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. You're so welcome. Thank you.